Thank you, uh, Stuart, for that uh, exuberant introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm always happy to accept an invitation from Stuart to speak because he gives us 20 minutes each or 40 minutes to talk about a subject which would normally take up a full semester. Uh, so uh, it's always a challenge to try and say something. And I'm all a bit unhappy though because he always asks me uh, when I have to be the bearer of bad news. Because the question is, uh, where to now? But before <coughs> we begin on where to now, of course we're all extremely relieved to see the last of he who shall not be named. But it's important, especially given the events of January the 6th and the raid on the Capitol building, that we keep a few things in mind. Uh, and I'm going to spend one or two minutes on a bit of history here. I'm going to begin by telling, telling you really in a way my own story. I was born at the time when uh, <coughs> uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president. Now most of you have probably forgotten the fact that when the elections take place in November, and they're now the president is inaugurated in the middle of January after the Senate and the joint houses have approved the Electoral College vote. When FDR came to the presidency, he was not initiated, he was not inaugurated until the 15th of March. Now, let's, if you're talking about democracy, you have to wonder about how functional a democracy is when you have an election in November and the new person takes over in January or March. But we won't go there because that's David's area. <laughs> but on the 6th of February in 1933, oh, sorry, uh, 19, when was it? Uh, yes, 32, 33, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was attacked by a man with a gun who attempted to assassinate him. And in fact, he assassinated the mayor of <coughs> Chicago instead. He missed, he missed Roosevelt. The question is, did he miss Roosevelt deliberately or was he going for the mayor of Chicago because he was an Italian and the mayor of Chicago was cracking down on the mafia? <laughs> so, anyway. But, why are we surprised to see a gang of people raiding the Capitol building when in this year, in 1968, when I was a graduate student in the United States, Robert Kennedy, a candidate for the presidency, was assassinated. He was the brother of John F. Kennedy in 1962, 63. So assassinations and violence go hand in hand with the presidency. The first example, of course, was when a senator assassinated the former treasurer of the United States, in other words, when Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton in a duel and killed him. So we haven't yet had anybody call up on Trump for a duel or even attempt to assassinate. So, so far, things are not looking as bad as you might think. Mind you, oh, well, we won't. Now, anyway, so what can we expect um, from the current situation in terms of looking in foreign relations? We've got two choices. We can look back and see what we can learn from that, or we can fantasize about the future, and as a historian, I'm naturally going to look back. And I'm going to remind you of a few things, as I say. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president when I was born, followed by Harry Truman, who was, who was responsible for dropping uh, the atomic bomb. And also, but more importantly, as far as foreign relations is concerned, uh, articulated what became known as the Truman Doctrine, which was the, the pledge to defend against the Soviet Union any country who seemed to be threatened by, not was threatened by, but in the opinion of the United States, 
could be threatened by the Soviet Union. Now that doctrine became standard operating doctrine in the United States, but it's important to recognize that it was based on what we'll call collaborative or uh, cooperative, uh, coordinated with allies rather than unilateral policy. Then you have Dwight D. Eisenhower, and you'll notice I'm wearing an I like Ike badge, because Eisenhower was the first to realize that the path that Truman had embarked upon was one heading towards disaster both domestically and in terms of foreign policy, and he warned against it. He was the only president thus far who's actually served at a high level, being the commander in chief of the Allied forces and then charge of Allied forces in Europe after the war, about war, who knew what war involved, who was involved in war and was determined to avoid it at all costs. Uh, and he more or less did. Uh, and he warned us against the uh, military industrial complex. Then, of course, we have JFK, everybody's hero. And talk about terror, and talk about alarm, and talk about recklessness. John F. Kennedy brought us to the point of nuclear oblivion in the Cuban Missile. And had it not been for his brother, and had he taken the advice of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we would not be having this conversation at the moment. We'd be still trying to bury, dig our way out of the tunnels that we'd been buried in uh, as a result of the nuclear holocaust. So I'm not actually too upset. Well, let me put it another way. I'm not surprised by what happened, because it seems to me those of us who've lived through this have lived through terror which far exceeds anything we're living through or uncertainty or recklessness or in, in, uh, anything of that kind uh, today. And then, of course, uh, after, in the 1964 election, you'll remember when Lyndon Johnson was up against Barry Goldwater, Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. This is 1964. Words written to him, for him, by the way, by a man called Harry Jaffa, who, by the way, just in passing, I did study with at Claremont in California. So here I am, listening to this guy who is telling Goldwater that extremism in uh, the face of, uh, in the defense of liberty is no vice. And then, of course, you have Richard, Richard Nixon. Well, what can you say about Richard Nixon? The man is guilty, together with his Secretary of Defense, or Secretary National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, of genocide in Vietnam and Cambodia. Genocide in Cambodia. Now, Trumpy, you might not like Trumpy's way of dealing with Kim Jong-un, and you might not like the fact that he likes Putin, or that he thinks that Xi Jinping, uh, he could do business with him. He's not committing genocide. He has not sent more troops into the Middle East the way our good friend George W. Bush did. Now, George W. Bush transformed the United States foreign policy from uh, multilateral activity to unilateral activity. He said after 2001 that the United States will in fact take unilateral action if threatened or if its allies are threatened in the Middle East. Unilateral action. That's what we're worried about with Trump. But George Bush had said this and has committed and did commit the United States to what we now call the forever war. 19 years since 2001, and troops are still in Afghanistan. They're still in messing around in Syria, where they shouldn't be anyway. And their strongest ally is the country who was the base for the organization and the movement that led to 9-11 in the first place. So I think 
we get a little bit carried away by the present nation, presentness of the news cycle, and we think, how can it be worse, or can it be worse, or should it be worse, or whatever. Now, it is not going to get any better. Biden said, we are going to return America to global leadership. Global leadership. And, for, and to, we're going to make America great again in a leadership role. Now this is an absent, he shouldn't do this. It's, it, it's a very foolish policy. And if he tries to do it, he's going to end up with the United States if it doesn't engage in warfare, it's going to engage, it's going to involve us in this conflict with China, the Southwest. If we agree to uh, the policy which is to contain China, China is the new Russia. We are now containing China. We're not cooperating with China. We're not welcoming its, the fact that it's lifted its economy, that its economy grew by 5% last year. They are the devil incarnate because of their persecution of the Uyghurs. Does anybody know how big the area of the Uyghurs occupied is by any chance? It's about the size of Spain, isn't it? It's about the size of Iran. There are 80 million people in that area uh, of that province. It's the largest province in China. 46% of Uyghurs. The average age of Uyghurs has gone up since 1952 from 32 to 70. Okay, so they've increased the age of population. They have increased the size of the population. And they now and they are built in that province museums, galleries, uh, schools and hospitals that were absent from what was essentially a fairly impoverished area in the south of that, that province uh, in China. So it's not entirely as clear as we're led to believe by those who are seeking to weaken China because of its economic prosperity and growth, having lifted, as you all know, uh, some 800 million people out of poverty since the Cultural Revolution an achievement which makes Europe a bit sluggish, in my opinion. Anyway, so here's a joke. Now, just think about this. When Kennedy was president, we had a man who was 40 to 43 years of age. We've now got, we've, they've just elected a man who's 78 to replace a man who's 74. And the House of Representatives is run, run by a person in her 80s, who's 80, and the minority leader in the Senate is 76. And we're supposed to think that this is somehow going to make things better. These guys have been around for years. What Biden has done is brought in the Obama team and the Clinton team. And just in case you're wondering about them, because they've had a terrific press. Oh, by the way, just, I just wanted to read what a man called uh, uh, McGovern uh, uh, who, oh no, Senator Fulbright, who you might uh, remember back from the Senate years in the 1960s. Out of the well-intentioned but misconceived notion of what patriotism and responsibility require in a time of world crisis, Congress has permitted the President to take over the two vital foreign policy powers which the Constitution vested in Congress. And this is at the instigation of John F. Kennedy the power to initiate war, and the Senate's power to consent or withhold consent from significant foreign commitments. That's been withdrawn. So completely have these two powers been taken over by the President that it is no exaggeration to say that as far as foreign policy is concerned, the United States has joined the global mainstream where it become, for the purposes of foreign policy, and especially for the purposes of making war, a presidential dictatorship. And you can blame John F. Kennedy for that. And he also took over one other power that we don't think to pay much attention to, although we should be because Trump is talking about the whole time, the power to impose and lift, lift tariffs. That was up until Kennedy. That was a congressional prerogative. It's now a presidential prerogative. Now, I just 
that understanding what's happening at the moment is actually going to require some historical perspective. As much as we can take a stab at it tonight, we're going to need a lot of historical perspective in the future to understand whether at the moment we're at the start of something, in the middle of something, or at the end of something. And I, I don't really know where we are at the moment, so I'm very glad to be following on from someone who gave us so much historical uh, perspective on this. And we agreed beforehand that the basic division of labour would be he addresses the international and I address the domestic uh, in the American context. And like Ian, I'm very interested in questions of what has actually changed and what is just a sort of continuation of the norm. So tonight I'm going to look at, first of all, one thing which is widely and incorrectly believed to have changed, but is actually a continuation of the norm. Another thing that is widely and incorrectly believed to be a continuation of the norm, but has in fact changed significantly. <laughs> so, the first thing that I want to talk about is the myth of the pre-extremist Republican Party. So, there's been a lot of hand-wringing among the sort of major, I suppose you could call them, establishment organs of the American media, everything from TV stations to NBC to newspapers like the Washington Post, lamenting the rise of extremism within the Republican Party. And so, one of the most well-known Republican members of Congress today is a woman called Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was only elected a few months ago in the state of Georgia. If you, can, if you can think of a crazy conspiracy theory, she believes it. In fact, you could probably make one up now. Um, let's make up a conspiracy theory now. Pete Evans controls international banking through a ring of Malaysian restaurants. <laughs> Tell that to Marjorie Taylor Greene, she's probably going to retweet it. Um, everything from there were, you know, no planes crashed into the buildings on 9-11 to uh, QAnon is real and Hillary Clinton likes wearing masks made of human faces. She believes it all. I don't know, well, I don't know how, much how, she, how much she believes it, but she has worked out that the route to fame and power is through amplifying the crazy as much as possible. After all, that was one of the ways that Donald Trump got there as well. Okay, this person is a member of Congress now. Uh, the leader of the uh, House of Representatives of the Republican Party, the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, promised to have a stern chat with her. <laughs> who knows what came of that? Uh, this, just this afternoon, Mitch McConnell, who was, his, was the majority Senate leader of the Republican Party, now the Senate minority leader, uh, said that this kind of lunacy was endangering the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. She immediately tweeted back, no, no, the only thing endangering the Republican Party is Republicans who don't know how to do anything except lose gracefully. Right, so for her it's all about winning, and as far as she sees, winning is about amplifying the craziness. So there's been a lot of moaning about why can't the Republican Party police this extremism within its ranks? It is not because the Republican Party is incapable of policing its own ranks. Currently, the Republican Party is policing its own ranks very effectively right across the United States, essentially conducting a purge of anyone who's seen as being sufficiently, insufficiently loyal to Trump, the president who just got voted out of office and is the first president since 1932 to oversee the loss of the White House, the House of Representatives and the Senate in a single term. Nonetheless, from Arizona to Maine, State Republican parties, which these days are staffed with Trump loyalists, are censoring those Republicans who commit the crime of acknowledging the fact that Biden won the election. In Arizona, we're seeing this particularly grisly spectacle of the censoring of Cindy McCain, the wife of the late John McCain. Now, however you feel about John McCain, you can probably understand that Cindy McCain wants to defend her late husband's memories from these relentless attacks from Trump and his cohorts. The Arizona Republican Party has ruled that that is uh, just completely beyond the pale and, uh, and has censored her. So, no, the Republican Party is very, very good at policing its own ranks. In fact, if you want to talk about can uh, cancel culture, 
uh, you know, the Republican Party puts universities to shame in terms of how effectively it actually carries it out. So there's no, no issue with how effectively the Republican Party can police its own ranks. The issue is that it does not want to police extremism within its ranks. Why would it? Since the 1960s, extremism has been a source of energy and strength within the Republican Party. So Ian mentioned Goldwater. Goldwater lost, is it 44 or 45 states in the 1964 election? Uh, nonetheless, the Goldwater direction was what became the future of the party. So in case you're wondering whether a decisive electoral defeat of Trump means that Trumpism is going to get wiped out, that would, that would suggest not. Goldwater was the one who mobilised the grassroots. And currently the, the grassroots are with Trump. Nonetheless, though, there's all of this mythology about how, in the past, the Republican Party used to purge extremists from its ranks and that the conservative movement, in general, used to purge extremists from its ranks. A lot of this is to do with uh, some sort of opportunistic self-publicity from William F. Buckley, the conservative editor of National Review, who in the 1960s claimed that he had exiled the John Birch movement from uh, conservatism. And this is, this is a myth that's been repeated ever since and gets bigger every year. It's a myth. He did not exile the Birches from conservatism in the US. The Birches became the mainstream of uh, conservatism in the United States. What Buckley did was the time-honoured tradition of, of attacking someone who had become particularly embarrassing. So that was Robert Welch, the Midwestern candy manufacturer who was the uh, founder of the John Birch Society. He'd become a bit of a problem from a PR point of view because he was claiming that Ian Bickerton's favourite president, Eisenhower, was in fact a communist. <laughs> that was a little bit beyond the pale uh, in the 1960s. So Welch kind of got pseudo-ostracised. The John Birch movement was allowed to live on. That is how, to this day, when the Republican Party wants to police its ranks, it does it. It attacks people who have become embarrassing. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is becoming a little bit embarrassing because she possibly believes that the earth is controlled by giant lizard people. Uh, Steve King, who was a congressman from Iowa who got primaried out last year, was becoming embarrassing because he declared that he felt that there was no problem with white nationalism uh, as a concept. That's probably a belief that's shared by a lot of Republicans, but it's not something that you can admit to. So Republicans are good at policing embarrassing extremists, but it, they're not going to police extremism out of their ranks because this is where the energy is coming from. Uh, you know, this is where you get the people who are prepared to go from door to door in a pandemic. There were literally millions of doors knocked on by Republican canvassers during the pandemic, something that the Biden campaign wasn't prepared to do, despite the fact a lot of activists in the Democratic Party were urging the Biden campaign to do it because it put them at a serious disadvantage. This was one of the reasons why Trump got so close uh, in some ways in the last election campaign, because his door-knocking operation was as big as it had been during the previous campaign, whereas the Democrats had nothing. Who is going to be willing to do that? It's extremists. You don't, you don't read extremists uh, out of the movement, and the Republican Party is not going to do it. So that's just the first thing I wanted to address. This is actually an area of continuity, not an area of change. The Republican Party has never been that good, or, sorry, more accurately, never been very willing to police extremists out of the movement. Something where there has been significant change, though there may be an appearance of continuity, is the religious character of conservatism in the US and particularly the role that Trump plays in all of this. So a question that I was constantly asked over the last four years as someone who studies religion in American politics is, how does the most irreligious president in history, right? To, how, how does someone who, when pressed on his knowledge of the Bible, when asked what his favourite book is, says all of them? Um, <laughs> you know, how, how does this person become the hero of evangelical Christians in America? Now, there are a few different answers to this. 
One is basically that he delivered the, the goods. So three Supreme Court justices, perhaps even more consequentially, more than 200 uh, federal judges in the end. He did things, he went so far with some measures to make evangelicals happy that he actually surprised them. Right? They weren't expecting him to ban trans people from the military within his first year, which he did a completely mindless uh, thing, but nonetheless made them happy. A lot of previous presidents had said they wanted to move the US Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. He actually did it. And so the fact that he delivered results was more important to them than anything else. In fact, by the time Trump came along, evangelical Christians in America were sick of their own leaders because most of their own leaders until that point had been constrained at least to some degree by Christian morality. Trump was not. Okay, they weren't looking for a Sunday school teacher. They were looking for a fighter. And they saw it in Trump because Trump not only is not constrained by Christian morality, he wasn't constrained by any morality whatsoever. Right, this is who you want to send into battle for you. And at the much laughed at speech he gave at Liberty University where he talked about a, um, a book of the Bible that is very precious to evangelicals, Second Corinthians, and called it Two Corinthians. <laughs> a lot of journalists were there, kind of laughed at it, and went home. They missed the more significant bit of the speech, which came later, where Trump said, I will fight for you because I'm not politically correct. Okay, what that audience heard was, yeah, you're not really one of us, but you've got the same enemies as us. And that's what we really care about. Now, there are a lot of evangelicals who believe that Trump was, in fact, anointed by God, chosen by God. And I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the Bible, but there's a figure in the Old Testament called Cyrus the Great, heathen king of Persia, who helped deliver the Israelites from their enemies. So he was this imperfect man used as a vessel by God. That is who Trump was constantly likened to in evangelical circles. But to get to the point about change um, in all of this, the evangelicals who were most supportive of Trump from the very beginning were not the George W. Bush style evangelicals. Okay, so you know, we've seen extensive evangelical influence in American politics before, especially during uh, the Bush era. But those evangelicals, it was largely dominated by denominations such as the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, these are the traditional power brokers of evangelical politics in America uh, and the traditional sort of centres of intellectual life of evangelicals are Bible study groups. They've got this quite kind of scholarly approach to their religion and there's something that's... There's a, a degree of historical continuity about it that goes back a long way in American politics. It's important to understand that from the outset, this was not Trump's support base. Trump's support base was Pentecostal. So Pentecostalism, for those of you not familiar with it, is a variety of evangelicalism that doesn't so much stress uh, the Bible. It stresses physical experience. Pentecostalism is about the experience of the Holy Spirit. It's about experiencing the Holy Spirit in the same way that Jesus' disciples did on the day of Pentecost. If you ever see a Pentecostal service, it's very, very physical. People sing at the top of their lungs, they raise their arms in worship, they, they dance, they are constantly uh, touching each other. Um, even, uh, Pentecostals believe in things like the power of faith to heal. They believe in the power of ordinary people to have prophecies and, uh, and to have prophetic dreams. In many ways, it is like the most extreme version of Protestantism in terms of there is no mediation between you and your relationship with God. An ordinary person can be a prophet. While, even though Pentecostal uh, churches exist and have hundreds of millions of members worldwide, there are literally half a billion Pentecostals worldwide, a lot of the way that Pentecostalism operates is through essentially media entrepreneurs, uh, people who have TV stations, people who have radio shows, you can see why there would have been this mutual attraction between Trump and Pentecostals. 
Uh, Trump is also someone who likes to have no mediation of institutions uh, whatsoever. He used Twitter to talk directly to his people uh, the whole way through his presidency before Twitter finally cut him off. A lot of Pentecostals who the book of the Bible they're most concerned with is Revelation, right? they, they believe that the end is around the corner, they get very excited by someone like Trump because they think he's going to bring about the end of the world. Right? They think he, this, is, this guy is so disruptive, he must actually be a fulfilment of prophecy. And it doesn't matter what he believes personally, the fact is that God has put him here for a purpose. So Trump's relate from the very beginning, while a lot of other Christians were really sort of wary of Trump, Pentecostals and Pentecostal entrepreneurs in particular really flocked to trust him. And they have been with him ever since. They have not abandoned him. It will not surprise you to know there's a lot of overlap between Trump, sorry, between Pentecostalism and conspiracy theories like QAnon. QAnon is just a, a sort of secular version of prophecy. It's fairly easy to actually uh, combine those things together. One of the reasons why Trumpism is not going away is because Trump retains a lot of power in these Pentecostal circles. Now, this is very significant because Pentecostalism is the fastest growing segment of Christianity worldwide. When you combine Pentecostals and Charismatics, who are people who take Pentecostal practices into other denominations, there are about half a billion, or six or seven hundred million of them worldwide. 58% of the population of Brazil, for example, are Charismatic Catholics, nominally members of the Catholic Church, but who nonetheless engage in uh, Pentecostal practices of worship. The leader of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, is a Charismatic Catholic, and his support base is largely Pentecostal and uh, charismatic. Across the developing world, Pentecostalism is largely the uh, sort of fastest growing segment of Christianity, but it's in Australia that we get the world's first ever Pentecostal uh, democratically elected Prime Minister in, uh, in, in Scott Morrison. Now, if I'm freaking you out at this point, actually, don't freak out, no, no. What I've discovered through my research is political circumstances of the country matter. So Scott Morrison is actually very, very constrained compared to someone like Trump or Bolsonaro, where here Pentecostals are about 1% of the population. Also, Pentecostalism here, frankly, looks quite different to what it does in the US. Here, prosperity gospel isn't a big thing. Here, most Pentecostals, at least the ones that I've talked to, are not actually imminently uh, expecting the end of the world. Here, Scott Morrison has to defer to scientific rationality. Okay, so Scott Morrison may say on election night, I've always believed in the power of prayer, but Scott Morrison doesn't say prayer is going to end the epidemic. Maybe that's what he believes, but he can't uh, say that. He's, he's very, very constrained. Trump, on the other hand, who doesn't believe a thing uh, about God, is nonetheless free to say things like, if Biden gets elected, God will be dead. Okay, so there's... A massive national contextual difference in terms of the kind of uh, rhetoric you can use. Also, it's interesting to look at Australia and to think we've had now seven years of conservative rule, starting with this conservative Catholic Cole Warrior in Tony Abbott, and now we're on to the most devout Christian Australia has ever had as Prime Minister. What's happened over the last seven years? We've had national legalisation of same-sex marriage and we've had... Um, increased liberalisation of abortion in three states over the last two years. Australia's Conservatives have this unique knack of losing culture wars while they're winning elections. Um, it works very differently in the United States where the two things tend to move in tandem. So my time is just about up, but that actually is something that's changed significantly. And unfortunately, we won't be able to understand the way that global politics is going uh, over the next few decades until we can come to terms with Pentecostal and Charismatic Christianity. Thanks. My question to you is come and sit here. My question deals with the proposed um, anti-domestic terror, terrorism legislation in the US. And my greatest fear that it might drive a deeper wedge between rural America and urban America, which is more 
cosmopolitan. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I, I think that uh, classifying the current problem of right-wing extremism as terrorism is actually a terrible idea because the word terrorism, whenever it gets used in the United States, this is a signal that civil liberties are going to be completely dragged under and uh, trampled on. It's a word that basically crushes any kind of analytical understanding of the category that you're talking about. You just you don't gain anything uh, from calling your opponents terrorism. Terrorists, that division that you've talked about is uh, absolutely correct. But also, w when you call these right-wing extremists terrorists, it's not going to be very long before that is then applied to the left as well. Uh, or then, then apply to sort of anyone who uh, who disagrees. So I'm call, there's a lot of debate about what to call these people, insurrectionists uh, or whatever. But terrorists, I think, is the last thing that we should call them. I don't have anything to add to that. That's fine. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Thank you for great uh, speeches. You mentioned uh, that uh, you thought that uh, Morrison wasn't uh, entirely captured by religious corporations in that he wouldn't think uh, God will fix a pandemic. But he won on the back of, quote unquote, I've always believed in miracles. So my question is, are you sure we're not underestimating, underestimating his stupidity? Yeah. As I said, it's not even about what he believes personally. It's the way that he is constrained politically. It's what he's, what he's allowed to say and uh, what he's allowed to do. He probably does believe that God helped him to uh, to win that election. I mean, after that, uh, that election, I was prepared to entertain that as a theory as well. Um, but but he can't say, okay, um, we're going to get rid of uh, all of the scientific and medical advisors that we have and, and replace them with Brian Houston uh, and George Pell. He just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, but he can't. Okay, go to the next question. Um, my question, yeah, my question also concerns uh, religious issues, or um, namely uh, religious uh, groups. Um, back in the uh, 80s, uh, a, a, a huge conservative force, uh, particularly that uh, powered uh, Reagan, was the um, at the time we referred to them as uh, evangelicals and um, fundamentalists and so on. Uh, certainly, stylistically, there are some uh, notable differences with the uh, more charismatic Pentecostalists and so on. The group that was around in the 80s seemed quite sort of more sort of traditional bits of the stage, you know, more sort of, um, sort of picture of Bible reading and so on, rather than chopping in the air and so on. But apart from that, uh, what would be some of the uh, political differences between the two groups, um, particularly uh, in regard to uh, social issues? Would you say they're virtually entirely the same, or would there be some differences Uh, what, what matters is the areas of emphasis. So basically these Pentecostals and Charismatics are not doctrinaire conservatives. And this is why they're always more attracted to populists than they are to doctrinaire conservatives. Overall, but, you know, conservatives want things to stay the same. These are people who want radical change. Um, you know, the most radical change of all, which is the end of the world. So that's the big difference. Uh, just a quick story. Reagan actually did have one Pentecostal in his cabinet. James Watt, the Secretary of the Interior, widely regarded as one of the worst secretaries of the interior of all time, actively uh, anti-environmentalist, but the only time his Pentecostalism really came out was when he banned the Beach Boys from performing at the National Mall because he thought that rock and roll music was the work of the devil. The Beach Boys! <laughs> and they're not always Pentecostalists. I mean, there was the Father Coghlan in Chicago back in the 30s. I mean, he was an extremist as he could be and conservative, and they have all sorts of issues, not, not, all, not only moral issues, but environmental issues and uh, political issues as well, uh, about the role of the state in the economy and so on. But they're not restricted solely to Pentecostalists, although they are the most prominent and public of the groups. Uh, yeah, I want to ask a question about the way people are encouraged to think whether it's in the United States or here. Uh, David, you've uh, 
referred to a whole series of uh, religious beliefs that I find, you know, I have a sense of disbelief mm. as a secular person. Mm. Uh, Ian, you've referred to a whole succession of presidents who seem to be happily authoritarian uh, and, who, and who in foreign policy took violence as a way to solve problems for granted. Now, both, I mean, so in a country that is, that is largely, to me, secular and pretty irreligious, mm. namely Australia, um, uh, the question about why do people think like this is, is a pretty serious question. Mm. I mean, it, I could ask, uh, in, in a way, the corollary question that goes with it is, why the hell do people, who believes conspiracy theories and why? But that's the last question. I want you to have a go at the other ones first. They're easy questions. Well, I guess the question as to why the United States is so religious, and maybe you will be a better answer than I will on this probably, but it does go back very much to the Puritans and to the founders of New England who saw themselves as a city upon a hill, as an exemplar for the world, and that they were carrying out the will of God because they were persecuted and they were religious persecuted, religiously persecuted. Maryland was founded by Catholics who had the same sort of approach. Mm. So religion became tremendously important in uh, their self-identity. Mm. And the United States has, for, throughout its history, even as 13 colonies and then as an early nation, wanted to be recognised as an independent, individual nation with a separate identity. And, and God played an important role in that, in that identity. And when you add then questions like race, and you get scientists and others coming along and saying, well, of course, we have evolution, so therefore some groups are more superior to others, and then you add creationism to that, you've got God supporting racial segregation, and slavery, and if you give up, you can't give up God, so you keep slavery, but if you give up slavery, maybe you have to give up God. So they're intertwined in a kind of inseparable way that a modern person might want to separate, but not if you are, in fact, a deeply religious or you're involved in an economy which is dependent upon a belief system which in your heart of hearts you know to be fallacious and false because you're dependent upon these slaves who have skills far beyond your own and yet you keep thinking to yourself you're superior because God has ordained it that way. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a circle you can't escape from. Yes, yeah, so the United States is a, an advanced industrial democracy that has the religious profile of somewhere like Iran or Mexico or Poland in terms of its levels of religious belief and practice. Um, as, the, as the son of a Protestant minister, I've never had a problem understanding uh, religious belief. It brings a lot of comfort, it brings meaning, it brings social networks, it brings mutual help. There's, there's all sorts of very good things about religion and benefits that it, uh, that it brings to people's lives. Also, I know as a social scientist of religion that the process of religious conversion doesn't happen with belief first. The process of religious conversion happens with the social world first. About 50% of religious conversions happen because someone marries, uh, marries a, a religious person. Um, to, to think of it this way, how many of you have ever been uh, confronted by a Jehovah's Witness? Yeah. Show of hands. Yeah. Great. How many of you converted? No. Okay. It, how many people... of us have converted as, as, as a, fact, a Jehovah's Witness to uh, some other fact? That's the question. Yes. Yeah. So, but but anyway, it doesn't just you don't just get convinced overnight. Mm. This is uh, this is what I believe. It happens through a very sort of so, slow process of. Uh, of uh, social acculturation. Um, I think, yeah, and the United States, when you've, it's been religious for so long, although it goes in waves. There have been times when the US is a lot less religious, times when it's a lot more religious. The fact that there is this complete separation or near complete separation of church and state in the United States means that churches always had to compete with each other uh, for, essentially, for customers. 
this is one of the things why one of the reasons why American churches were always at the forefront of entertainment uh, in in people's lives and in music and also on some level of intellectual life you know seven percent of Americans are part of Bible study groups for many Americans and it has been this way since the beginning reading the Bible is the main uh, form of intellectual life I do want to address this point about conspiracy theories because as we were saying earlier um, conspiracy theories traditionally are not the realms of the stupid you know, I occasionally get uh, envelopes packed with uh, information, like when I've been on radio talking about 9-11 or something, I can always tell when the interview's gone to air because my inbox just fills up with people explaining to me why I'm wrong, um, why there, you know, why there couldn't have been, if damage could not have been caused by planes, I get all of this information. You know, this, this is not done by people who are stupid. You need to be pretty intelligent to follow these insane conspiracy theories. It's people who are misguided. But the innovation, possibly, that Trump has brought to this is what the philosopher Nancy Rosenblum called conspiracy theory without the theory. <laughs> Trump's not into conspiracy theories. Trump's into a vague sense that everyone is out to get him. And, you know, you don't need to be intelligent to follow along with that. And he's wrong. I just had a question about earlier how you mentioned uh, in Australia how... Um, Can you speak up? Sorry, um, I just had a question about um, earlier how you mentioned in Australia that more libertarian um, ideologically centred movements uh, were winning... Uh, uh, in Australia, and making progress such as uh, uh, the abortion, leg uh, abortion legalisation in different states, yeah. and uh, how more conservative uh, conservatives are winning elections. Yeah. And I just wanted to, see, uh, if you could elaborate how uh, that connection is made, since uh, you, you'd expect adversely. I also had another question about um, uh, in the United States, how you mentioned uh, conservative and uh, Republican parties become more extremist. Mm -hmm. um, would you uh, argue that? Would it be a fair argument to say that? Uh, conservatism is really at its peak um, in the sense that, um, especially you can, it's highlighted in um, like more the Black Lives Matter movement where um, they're replacing uh, racist uh, ideologies and sentiments with uh, states' rights, and et cetera. Yeah. yeah, sure. Just with the first question. So when John Howard was Prime Minister, he essentially legitimised a very small fringe group called the Australian Christian Lobby as the peak body of Christianity. Australian Christian Lobby was a tiny collection of Pentecostals who suddenly essentially got to the big time thanks to the patronage of John Howard. The Australian Christian Lobby's power was at its peak during Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. Uh, Rudd and Gillard sensed that there was a religious vote out there that they didn't want to offend. Rudd himself was a very sincere Christian, spoke at Australian Christian Lobby conferences, talked about the importance of Christianity in Australia. Gillard, who was an atheist, declared herself a cultural conservative who would not condone same-sex marriage because it was against the Bible and the Bible is the foundation of morality. It's, it's remarkable to think this was only 10 years ago that Labor was absolutely enthralled to this idea of an all-powerful Christian vote. Out there, and this was at the time when this very conservative, quite extreme group was able to be seen as somehow above politics. So, what happens? Tony Abbott gets elected, hardcore Catholic culture warrior. Some suddenly the whole population is aware hang on, who are these people? You know, it's, when you get a hardcore culture warrior, people are suddenly aware of the importance of these issues. All of a sudden, Labour goes from same sex marriage is an issue we can't touch to we are going to push for same sex marriage. Basically, from 2013, we're actually going to listen to the opinion polls on this. How about that? That 60% of people who support this is real. All of a sudden, the Australian Christian lobby becomes marginalised. They go, you know, they're put on the fringes of Australian politics. All of a sudden, everything that Tony Abbott says and does is under scrutiny for its religious content. You know, he's been like this forever. But when he's become Prime Minister, he goes from just becoming this, you know, bloke from Manly who likes to wander around with no shirt on, to, hang on, this guy's a really, really conservative Christian, which is not something that we are really into in this country for the most part. That is how the right loses culture wars while it wins elections. And can I just say something? Yeah. Look, I don't... 
we are now getting into a sort of academic debate, yeah. uh, which we should never do. But I can't let this <laughs> business about the Pentecostalists go without remarking yeah. that religion has been a backbone of the Australian federal political system since Federation. Mannix led the Catholics against conscription in yeah. World War I. Santa Maria formed a party of Catholics from the Labor Party. The Labor Party has been a party of Catholics. Religion isn't new, no. uh, or, and nor are the Pentecostalists anywhere near the influence that the Catholic Church had under Labor and with Santa Maria and under Mannix. Yeah. So let's just, if I can put that into a little bit of a context, Very let's not get carried away with Pentecostals. <laughs> They're a lovely bunch of people. The less you have to do with them, the better. Uh, but don't think that they are really playing the, a tremendously significant role compared to in this place. mainstream uh, Catholic. Even look at even look at Pell. I mean, goodness sake. Uh, uh, Please go. Okay. <laughs> um, I think I don't think you need to. Yes, you will. Very well. Okay. And I still think there's an overwhelming feeling amongst people who are politically aware that religious uh, decisions, decisions are being made politically based on religious beliefs. And we're aware that, you know, practicing uh, Christians in the uh, census are about 11% or 10% of the population. So there still seems to be a heavy weight from the National Party. And the, we're still ruled by a very conservative religious uh, background in Australia. I think that's, they're overly representative. And Morrison doesn't come out with anything radical or different or can't even make a strategy on uh, climate change. You know, he just basically is a PR man. But his backbone is religion, you know, that comes through. But getting back, sorry, getting back to Biden and the American direction, how, how would you say Biden's aligned himself with religion? Has he, do you think he's recognised by religious groups as having a particular stance there? Well, of course, Biden is the second Catholic to be elected president. I mean, he, he, religion is the centrepiece of his whole approach to politics, or at least he says that it is, and one has to take some note of the fact that throughout his entire, well, throughout his life as a boy, and then as a senator, and in his campaign, he has placed his Catholic belief as a centrepiece of the formation of most of his policies. Yeah. And, he's, he, uh, and Kennedy is much more religious, for example, than Kennedy ever was, yeah. uh, although he was the first Catholic president, obviously. So I don't think, I don't think it's going to alter Biden's position on most things, and it's not going to be identified as a Catholic position, and the Catholic Church may in fact not support his position. Mm. But individually, as a, an individual person, his Catholicism will remain uh, a key element. His mother, on his mother's, on his mother and his father's side, he's Italian as well. So, I mean, the guy's got no chance at all of giving it away. And he's married a Catholic woman. So, the game's over for him as an individual in terms of giving up his religious centrality. How that's going to translate into policy remains to be seen. Can I just, I, I think you ducked a bit. I was hoping you were going to say something about the fascination with cruelty and violence <coughs> as a way to solve problems that, uh, almost anywhere. I mean, you saw that uh, very sharply in the invasion of the Capitol, but whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, religious believers or authoritarian presidents. I mean, it's the fascination with, with cruelty and violence as a centre piece of that culture, but the, no, no different from other cultures, that, that is most threatening to me. And um, can, can, you, can you comment on, on, on that? Well, the, the only comment I can make on it is, is the sort of traditional carrot versus stick approach. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt declared back in 1900 that you walk, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. So the United States has always believed that the dominance of power, a 
and the use of force is the best instrument of foreign policy. But indeed, the carrot, or negotiation, uh, has probably been as more effective in it other ways. And if you take Obama as a good example of that, getting that agreement on the nuclear uh, deal with Iran was done through negotiations with the Europeans, P5, P5 plus one, and Iran, and it worked. Now we, we have Trump saying that doesn't work, and we're going to go and have Pompeo in the last day saying Iran is a terrorist state, and declaring the Revolutionary Guard a terrorist group, part of the armed forces, like saying the special forces are a terrorist group, which they are, of course. Any group like that that is using force the way they are, are terrifying to those against whom it's being used. And that's, that's what the meaning of terrorist is, inculcating terror. They're experts at it. Um, can I just say, first of all, do you think Biden's recognised supporting a political, uh, religious political viewpoint. Is he recognised as, as that one of his... Yes, it has, it has been commented upon extensively uh, as a Catholic position, and it's what it is. But Catholicism has never given, has never been a pacifist religion. You know, I mean, you have to fight a few crusades just to kill a few Muslims, we can kill them. We'll do it. Way of the world. Uh, and there's nothing to separate Pentecostalists from Catholics or even dare I say Anglicans from that. I mean, even Anglicans are given to the Bible. Anyway. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. So in the United States, pro life means anti abortion, it doesn't mean anti death penalty, it doesn't mean anti nuclear weapons. Uh, <laughs> It, it, you know, it doesn't mean anti-people dying during dangerous border crossings. In the rest of the Catholic world, there actually is far more of an observe, far more of a consistency there. If you're an Italian hardcore Catholic, you're against abortion, but you're also against the death penalty. In the United States, there's always been this thing of Catholics uh, take pro-life to mean anti-abortion and not really anything else. With, when Roe vs Wade happened in 1973, initially a lot of evangelical Protestants, especially the Southern Baptist Convention, didn't want anything to do with the anti-abortion cause because they saw it as this Catholic thing. What happened over the course of the 70s and the 80s was that uh, they were brought together into this conservative coalition. And the old denominational rivalries in the US between Catholics and Protestants and others evaporated, instead it was religious traditionalists versus religious liberals. And to this day, Biden is, like Obama was before him, it's less his denomination that matters, it's more his brand of religion. It's very sincere, it's very devout. When I heard Biden giving his acceptance speech, I thought, my God, it's weird to hear someone who actually believes in God back in office. Um, but what matters is it's the liberal version uh, of it. Any other questions? Please, please. Um, yeah, a bit left field. Uh, first of all, apologies from Jim McElroy, who usually sells this, this uh, newspaper, um, which you're very free to get for whatever you want to give me for it, we'll sell it. So, a uh, question a little bit left field for me is that. Um, I'm not from here, from Britain, where I grew up most of my life there. And for me, it seems like Australia was different in the 80s when I arrived. And the question was, the real, one of the real problems, I think, is Australia's thrill, being enthralled to the United States. Culturally, and with Murdoch, and with everything else, it's a bit of a tragedy. And when we had a marvellous um, uh, politics about a few, a few weeks, months ago, which was um, probably a year or two, um, it's like we, it was like Danish or, or, or Scandinavian, the Scandinavian model. But like it doesn't have to be. We don't have to be enthralled to this country, which in fact puts us in great danger. And much as I admire many people in the United States, it doesn't have to be like this. So I wonder if either of the excellent speakers this evening have um, 
have wondered to themselves how we can break free. The United States can is dangerous enough to the world without us being part of it, I think. And I just wondered if you agree with that and what we could do to break free and be and be a, a, a somewhat self, uh, you know, a, a somewhat different kind of a country to what we are now. Thank you. Well, the logic of the situation is crystal clear. And the imperative for Australia to be independent is also uh, very obvious. It's the managing of that that's the problem. And when you, and it depends in my view very largely on the role played by the United States in that process. We don't dictate to them what the relationship will be so much as they shape it in relation to us. Now there are things I think we could do which would make us more independent of the United States, uh, which would not, not in any way weaken our position internationally in where we are. Geographically we're part of Asia and Southeast Asia and we should recognise that. Now the first, one of the first things we should do since somebody mentioned Myanmar a little earlier is we should break ties with the Myanmar military immediately. But we have the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was established by Obama, which, uh, by Japan, I think, actually, and Obama joined, and then Trump withdrew. Now, the Trans-Pacific Partnership involves Asian countries in agreements and relationships with Australia which we could also maintain. So if we didn't allow Americans to base their armed forces, bases in Australia, if we refused, for example, to do patrols in the South China Sea with exercises which were provocative, we could still maintain close economic ties with the United States, or as economic as close as we want. We still share a kind of sense that uh, we like, we know a lot of people in the US, we, we enjoy their movies and one thing and another, we, they're a great tourist destination, all those sorts of things. I don't know that we want to emulate their political structures or systems at all in any way, and I don't think there's any likelihood that we will. But if we could lessen those other ties, we would be much better off individually as a nation and we would still maintain close and closer links. My view is that our natural links are India rather even than China. But there is no doubt, of it. and we've demonstrated, and China has demonstrated, that we can be independent of each other. China's managed to find products outside Australia that we thought they couldn't find, and we've managed to find markets which we didn't think we would be able to find since all of this business has started with the antagonism with China. So we have to give up the antagonism with our northern countries, perhaps try and strengthen what I see as much more natural ties with India by virtue of the historic Commonwealth. Not that I want to go back to the Commonwealth, but nonetheless, it is predominantly an English-speaking nation with familiar with British kinds of institutions which we have, which are not necessarily the case with Indonesia or China or Vietnam or Cambodia or whatever. So I know that's not very specific, but I don't see us, I don't see it as being a sharp break, uh, but I do think, and I don't think we can shape the relationship with anybody in a sense. We, we are, although we're behind on climate change, we're behind on a whole range of issues but we can sort of, uh, I suppose, show some degree of detachment and take leadership from others. I don't know. What do you think? Well, look, there's a major difference. It's the difference between public investment and worship of privatisation. That's the major difference. And if we, if we, see, if, if you take, for example, the responses to COVID, we have universe, the most civilising factor. If you want to build a civil society. Yeah, sure. <coughs> is about universal health insurance. 
You don't have a policy that says we'll make a fortune out of people being sick, which is what which is what you have in, in the United States, which is why they have the, the, the deadly chaos of their non-response to COVID. So you, the, the uh, major reason why we should be 10 times more independent is that we should be <coughs> laudatory to ourselves about public investment. That's in terms of the, the, the very serious next 10 years post-COVID, if there is a post-COVID, it's about public investment. It's not about going into loan. I mean, Brexit is already chaotic because of the, the sort of restoration of empire idea. So that's the major, a major difference for me. And uh, a fascination with non-violence as central to the domestic and foreign policies, I would say, as opposed to, you know, arm yourself to the teeth. Anyway, that's, I meant to be in the well, chair, no, I'm sorry. And in that respect, we should make certain that we try to prevent the way in which the American drug companies are trying to uh, gain a position of influence with the medical profession and the government in Australia that they have in the United States. And that goes back to this public versus private business. And that's absolutely the key issue, there's no doubt. Australia needs to lose its conception of itself as a white nation. That's when the break will happen. Um, I'm very surprised at Stuart thinking there is contrast because we are privatising everything. So no, 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 I'm saying I mean, we're hardly any different to America. There's still a difference, and we don't want to go any further. Well, you have universal health. I, I, we won't go into that anymore because you, you have a question, don't you? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, my... I, was... I... <laughs> I just went over to the table and had a look at the, um, the actual title of this talk. <laughs> and um, yeah. the, the second part of it, with a democracy and internationalism, it just seems to me you could look at that in, in, in a sense on two levels. Because just before the First World War, the socialists throughout Europe, Western Europe, had a, had a great meeting. I forget whether it was on, I assume it was on the continent. But they very simply said, look, this looming war is actually nothing to do with us. It's simply to do with the rich and the powerful who are going to have a great big contest between themselves about who comes out on top in Europe. What we should do um, uh, is, is just try and avoid it one way or another and not be part of it. Um, on the other hand, it seems to me some the companies like IBM, Goldman Sachs could say, well, we are international, for heaven's sake. You, you're talking international. We're truly international. We're in every country, aren't we? The problem is that within those companies, once you enter in there and work in those companies, you do what you're told. You do what you're told by the people in charge. The idea that people have a civil role in civil society to have a part, to play a part in the decision making and, and affect the decisions that go on around them, that's completely unknown in the world of Goldman Sachs and IBM. But the issue, it seems to me, um, as you're talking, as you're saying before, that's playing out both in Australia and obviously is writ large in the USA, is there are political parties coming into power whose approach to politics is simply replicating that or those huge companies. In other words, I, neither Donald Trump nor Scott Morrison believes that you in here or most people outside should have any part in the decisions that affect them or in decision making. It's, it's for the better of and the rich and the powerful and the theoretically wiser people to decide for you what you will do. And I don't think Joe Biden is going to be too different in that regard. Yeah, I'd say even, even more than the IBMs and the Goldman Sachs of the world, we're now in an age where Google and Facebook are uh, calling the shots. Mm -hmm. And there was an article by... I think uh, Shoshana Zuboff, who's yeah. uh, uh, yes now Professor Emeritus at Harvard in business, uh, saying we are living in this age of surveillance capitalism, which has been coming for about 40 years, where these uh, the, the Zuckerbergs and the Sergey Brins and Larry Pages of the world exercise just unfathomable levels of control that has pretty much been voluntarily ceded to them by people and by governments with no idea of what we were handing over. 
uh, to them. So I'm going to make your pessimistic comments even more pessimistic. <laughs> um, in, yeah, just in terms of the uh, the kind of authoritarianism, corporate authoritarianism we've let right. into our lives. Yeah. yeah. Sure. the Pentecostals are all nutters, so I get that. But you mentioned uh, charismatic Catholics. Yes. Uh, forgive my ignorance, it's something I'm not familiar with right. as, a, as a term. Yes. So what is, it, what is a charismatic Catholic as opposed to a fundamentalist Catholic? Mm -hmm. Where does the real power lie with, in there? And where is Joe Biden on that spectrum? Sure, sure. So that's all. First of all, I would say Pentecostals aren't all nutters. And I would say in terms of belief in general, if you probe anyone's beliefs about anything very deeply, you're going to find craziness. Uh, yeah, everyone's crazy. Oh, no. Everyone's crazy in their own way. Um, charis so charismatic Catholics, and I'm, I'm glad you asked about where does the authority lie. The answer is, with all charismatic Christianity, the authority is highly dispersed. You go to the charismatic figure. For a lot of people, that charismatic figure was Trump. Um, uh, even though they, you know, even though he's not a religious leader, nonetheless, they they saw God in him. So this is why charismatic Christianity is organised in these very entrepreneurial ways because you get these charismatic figures who uh, who who draw people to them. It's different from fundamentalism in that fundamentalism is all about the Bible is the word of the Lord. The Bible is the only source of authority. You know, not some guy on TV, right? Not some guy on TV claiming that he's performing miracles and uh, seeing prophecy. Fundamentalists are against that. Fundamentalists are about the inerrant word of the Bible. That is, uh, that is authority. Charismatics are far more about, no, anyone can be a prophet. Uh, I read far too many self-published books uh, that I got from Amazon <laughs> about people's dreams that they had had prophesizing Trump. Um, there was one guy who, when Secretariat, the horse, won the Kentucky Derby in 2012, stretched this out into a prophecy about how Trump was going to win the election in, uh, in 2016. This is not something that a fundamentalist believes, right? Because uh, fundamentalism is... It's, it's about the Bible. A quick word on fundamentalism. No one literally believes the Bible. Uh, anyone who takes the Bible seriously, as fundamentalists do know that there's all kinds of different language in there. Some of it is supposed to be history, some of it's supposed to be poetry, some of it's supposed to be prophecy, uh, some of it is supposed to be parable. The reason why people spend all this time at Bible study is not because the Bible is a self-evident document, right? It's because they know they have to read different parts of the Bible differently. So fundamentalists, they treat the Bible as the inerrant word of God. The big thing for them is that is the source of authority. For charismatics there are all kinds of other potential sources of authority, especially charismatic individuals. And that's what makes charismatic Catholics different. They might not, they might see Bolsonaro as more important to them than the Pope. And that question has been, of course, a central question within Catholicism. Since the 7th century. Yes. Who is the source of authority? The Pope or Martin Luther? Yeah. Or J John Calvin? Or Bishop Fulton Sheen? Yeah. Who knows? That's a good question. Could you, could you two finish up by making a brief comment about a key word that's in the title that we haven't really mentioned? It's called democracy. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, well, though, with, with a democracy, the implications not just in the United States, but here in Britain, um, in, in the context of this pandemic, etc. So, uh, and not just in terms of the major political parties. Yeah. My only observation about democracy in the United States is that it's not a democracy at all. Yeah. It is a plutocracy. Uh, nobody, the, the system is designed to prevent the will of the people being directly applied to government through any direct instrumentation to begin with. And secondly, if I told you that the average wealth of any federal lawmaker in the United States is 11 times that of the average income of American citizens, you get some sense that this is not we the people. 
This is we, the wealthy people. 631 billionaires made $1.1 trillion since the outbreak of COVID virus in the United States by virtue of the way in which wealth is distributed. 25% of Americans are currently food deficient, which is another way of saying they're starving. Now, in a democracy, that level of inequality is not going to happen. They only gave 1.1 or $2 billion for COVID relief and 631 billionaires made that much money throughout the COVID pandemic. It is not a democratic system. It is a plutocratic system ruled, as Fulbright said, in foreign policy by a presidential dictator. And don't forget this, talk about religion and, and so on in the United States. The President of the United States was ordained by the Founders as a demigod. You go from being Mr. Trump on January the 19th to godlike Trump on January the 20th at 12 noon if you are Mr. Trump. And you will remain a demigodlike status for some time until, like Icarus, he flies too close to the sun and crashes to the earth hopefully in a prison cell shortly. But it's not a democracy in any working sense that even we in Australia, and even here, you need to be, you're in a privileged group uh, if you're in, in, the, in the realm of politics. Uh, it's important to remember that democracy hasn't been around very long anywhere. Uh, the United States formally, legally extended the franchise to everyone, essentially in 1965, and in Australia it was 1966. So democracy is, even in places where it's established, is uh, relatively new. It is, I, I always find it interesting when you look at other countries around the world, including Australia, and you see these very smooth transitions of power, you see people acknowledging defeat, it's important to remember Trump actually just refusing to acknowledge he lost is just the latest extension of something that's been happening for quite a while in the United States of the losing side not accepting the legitimacy of the winning side. So Clinton, after, after 12 years of Republican rule, Republicans were not willing to accept that a Democrat had actually won. That's what the impeachment in 1998 was all about. George W. Bush, there were very legitimate concerns about whether he had actually won in 2000. And even when he really did win in 2004, I was living in the US at the time, I knew plenty of Democrats who refused to accept that he had ever won an election, who held conspiracy theories about voting machines in Ohio. By the way, those theories became the genesis of what is now being promoted on an industrial scale by uh, Republican conspiracy theorists. Barack Obama, I looked, I conducted a lot of survey data in the US about how Republicans felt about Barack Obama. Never, never had more than 50% of them willing to acknowledge that he was born in the United States. Right? A lot of Republicans refused to acknowledge that he was constitutionally eligible to be president. And Trump, well, frankly, a lot of people didn't accept Trump's uh, legitimacy. I certainly had a hard time with it um, because he didn't come close to winning the popular vote. Yes, he won according to the rules, but plenty of people were prepared to say this is not, you know, he's not my president, this isn't a legitimate thing. Now, it's a little bit more extreme what's going on at the moment in terms of just refusing outright to accept uh, that the electoral result happened. No qualifiers, anything, it's heresy within the Republican Party to currently accept it. But at the same time, that delegitimization. Um, is something that's been going on for a very long time. And I think, once again, it's going to take uh, a lot of historical perspective to actually understand this. Oh. Oh.